Well, hello, you scrap lords. Um, this wasn't totally planned, but I've been getting requests over the past uh, several weeks and months of doing the unicorn reviews. I always cover during the reviews the types of ammunition that you should be taking. And I kind of wanted to settle some of the questions that people had with tank ammunition, as in what different ammunition types do what, uh, what are they good at, what are they not good at, what you should be using on particular vehicles, what you should not be using. Uh, just in, in go over the history a little bit of different tank ammunition types and how it has developed uh, from pre-World War II to post-World War II and into the early Cold War era. In any case, let's get started. So for those of you who want to follow along, I am leaving a link down in the video description for you. I highly suggest you click on it. And I'm going to be going through that basic ammo guide from top to bottom. So to start off with, we're going to be starting with your basic armor piercing round. It is a solid shot projectile and designed to pierce armor using momentum alone. Now, the earliest armor piercing or purpose built armor piercing projectiles um, were de developed by the Germans in 1917 after uh, they got steamrolled, pretty much literally, uh, by the British tanks uh, on the Western Front, and maybe some of the French tanks as well. And what they did was, is they adapted, I believe it was a 77 millimeter or field artillery gun, which they modified into a direct fire weapon. And they, this was considered to be one of the very first proper towed anti-tank guns. Um, and it was extremely effective because most of the armor on World War I tanks at the time was in between about 12 to 20 millimeters thick. I mean, and, and the AP shells were more than enough to penetrate that kind of armor. Now, AP shells generally on, at, well, at first glance, will have decently high penetration levels, uh, depending on what the gun they're being fired out of, depending on the vehicle that they're on, uh, depending on the tier that they're at. But generally, AP shells will have a higher level of penetration than some of the other variants that we're going to get into here in a few minutes. The problem that armor-piercing shells in general, the solid shot AP rounds have, is that they are far more likely to ricochet off of sloped armor. Uh, it takes less of a slope to ricochet an armor-piercing round than it does the next type of ammunition we're going to get into. But before I get into that, most armor-piercing solid shot rounds are found early on in the game. Uh, the British use them quite a bit. The Americans use them, I believe, all the way up to tier 3, as well as the British in some cases. Uh, I believe on most of their 17-pounder guns, they get AP shells stock, um, as well as the uh, Comet's 77mm uh, round is an AP round. When they penetrate the tank, they will generally not do too much in the way of damage. They rely on hitting a critical component or hitting multiple crew members in order to do a lot of damage. So, if you're firing solid shot AP rounds, choose where you're shooting and choose wisely. Because generally, if you, let's say if you just hit the fuel tank on a vehicle and it doesn't set them on fire or anything, which generally it will, but even if it doesn't, he may still have the opportunity to turn around and kill you. So you have to be very careful with solid shot AP. And this brings us on to the next ammunition type. And that's going to be APC rounds, or armor piercing capped. Now, a lot of people are really confused when they see this round because they see it will generally have less penetration on it. And they think, oh, well, this round's got to be shit. Well, here's the thing that a lot of people don't take into account. Armor-piercing capped rounds have a soft steel cap that's covering the main solid shot armor-piercing round. And what this does is it, is it creates a phenomenon called normalization. So when a armor-piercing capped round hits the target, let's say that the target's armor is sloped back at 30 degrees. 
if an armor-piercing cap shell hits the target, the rear of the shell will lift up with the cap shell because the cap shell is essentially flat at the front, which will tilt the shell into the armor, thereby negating some of the sloping, and then it will continue on through. Now, what this means in layman's terms is that it's really good against sloped armor. Whereas the AP shell doesn't have very good normalization characteristics, it's far more likely to just skip off the armor pier- or the, uh, not the armor piercing, the sloped armor. The armor piercing cap shell is more likely to normalize with that armor, and therefore achieve a, a much more likely chance of penetration, so therefore it doesn't need to have that high of a penetration. Now granted, having higher penetration levels is always good, but it's not the only thing to take into account with APC rounds. Also, the biggest issue with APC rounds is generally their muzzle velocity and ballistic characteristics. Uh, since it's a blunt-nosed projectile, it's not very aerodynamic. Uh, and it has issues with long-range accuracy, and it's just not a very ballistically good round. So, you might be wondering how they fix this problem. Well, this leads us on to our third round type, and this is going to be the armor-piercing capped ballistic cap round. So, APCBC, or APBC. Like the name says, it's got a ballistic cap added onto the soft steel cap that's already attached to the armor-piercing round. So what this effectively does is it corrects the aerodynamic errors in the armor-piercing cap shell, allowing it to be more accurate, and faster flying, and have better kinetic energy upon impact. So it means that you've not only got the aerodynamic capability of a solid shot AP round, but you've got the benefits of the capped shell with normalization. So for most nations, this was a godsend. I mean, this solved most of the ammunition problems, and it's very easy to see why nations like the Germans went to basically converted straight over to armor-piercing cap ballistic cap as soon as they could. Now, there is also a subcategory called armor-piercing ballistic cap. Now, armor-piercing ballistic cap is just an armor piercing round with an even better ballistic cap on the top. It does not have the steel cap on it that allows it to better normalize with the armor, so therefore it's kind of a waste of uh, resources with this shell. It's not ideal. Um, an APCBC round would certainly do the job better, but it may be cheaper to produce. So. It just depends on the uses you have in mind for it. So, we've all been discussing up to this point solid shot ammunition. An armor piercing round that's solid shot, an APC round that's solid shot, an armor piercing cap ballistic cap round that's solid shot. Now, what happens if you had a high explosive into the mix? Well, you drastically increase the effectiveness of that round, not in terms of penetration. No, it does not do that. What it does is it enhances the damage the shell does after it penetrates the armor. This is generally what's known as a bursting charge. Now you can always tell your shell has a bursting charge by the explosion behind the shell. Now, some nations are more notorious for using this than others. The Russians in War Thunder are the most notorious for packing as much explosive as they can possibly fit into their shells. Now, there are problems that come up when you start putting lots of explosive filler in armor-piercing shells, because your first instinct would be to go, okay, well, why don't we just fill all of our shells with as much high-explosive filler as we can stuff in there, and that will just work just fine. The problem that that creates is that you have less kinetic energy behind the shell when it hits the target. Therefore, it is also very difficult to create a high velocity, high penetration round with sufficient explosive filler to detonate a tank in one shot. 
unless you have a very, very big gun, which the Russians seem to have realized and started mounting 122mm guns. Now granted, that was for a slightly different purpose, but this was a side effect of it. So quickly moving on here, now that you guys have gotten the point, bursting charges are good for knocking out tanks, however, only a certain amount of it can be used in a, in a shell and still maintain a high level of performance in armor penetration characteristics and ballistic characteristics. Now this leads me on to just regular old high explosive HE. Now a lot of people give HE crap for being totally useless in War Thunder, and you know what, in most cases they are right. Most tanks actually during the Second World War, I'll, I'll use the Sherman here as an example, most of the shells they carried in their tank were not armor piercing. It was high explosive. And the reason is that tank engagements, especially on the Western Front in Normandy, were ridiculously rare. Now, granted, this was a much different story for the Germans, who were encountering tanks on a regular basis, so they generally had a higher proportion of armor piercing as opposed to high explosive. But in the Sherman tanks, they generally had more HE because they were fighting a lot of anti dug in anti-tank guns, infantry, pillboxes, machine gun nests, snipers. Or they were fighting enemies that required HE more than anything else. That's why at the end of the war, when uh, the American tankers were starting to be supplied with Shermans with 105mm howitzers, they couldn't get enough of them because this thing had a much bigger explosive filler in this gigantic howitzer than the little 75mm Shermans or 76mm Shermans that they were using beforehand. Now, most people don't pay attention to how tanks are constructed, and, and you're probably wondering, how does this have any relation to tank shells? Well, just hear me out. So, early on, pre-war, most tanks were constructed using rivets, which is how they generally built warships, because tank development was originally started by the British Navy interestingly enough, or a commission of the British Navy. Riveting system was well known, and it was probably one of the most expensive ways to build a tank. Therefore, it was the most popular for some reason. Um, either that or the welding technology just hadn't gotten to the point where, they, where most nations were welding tanks. The problem with riveting tanks, as with warships, is that, yes, it's, it's very well crafted, it's, it's a beautiful machine, except until you get shot at. If an HE round hits... Actually, you know what? Before I go into that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a combat report I read um, of some British anti-tank gunners who engaged a group of uh, Italian tanks which were riveted in North Africa. There was a column of Italian tanks. I, I don't remember exactly what they were. They were older vehicles, uh, not Caro Veloces. They were, they were more than tank cats. Um, that were driving along a road, and they happened to be f passing right in front of a battery of British six-pounder anti-tank guns. For one ever reason or another, the anti-tank guns had HE loaded, and so they f and so they opened fire on these tanks, and the first gun to score a hit scored a hit with an HE round on one of these Italian tanks which knocked all the rivets out of one side of the vehicle and caused the vehicle to disassemble itself. The problem with riveting tanks is that if you get hit by an HE round, or even if you get hit by an AP round that just doesn't penetrate, that causes the armor to buckle a little bit, and since your riveting uh, construction causes the armor plates to be constantly under stress, that stress is released, and what it does is it sends these rivets breaking off and flying around the inside of the tank, which is what Nicholas Moran from Wargaming.net would call a significant emotional event. So, riveting your tanks, though it it looks beautiful and it it may have been good for the technology at the time, it's not a great way to build your tanks when you have them plan on being shot at a lot. Because um, the last thing the crew wants is to have extra objects entering the vehicle that don't need to be there. Now, before I move on to the rest of the armor-piercing shells, I'm going to talk about a British oddity. Uh, HESH, which stands for High Explosive Squash Head. Now, I get a lot of confusion with HESH, where 
people don't seem to understand how Hesh works. Hesh doesn't work by penetrating the enemy vehicle, much to World of Tanks' disbelief. Um, now, World of Tanks, uh, the way they've implemented Hesh is HE with very high levels of penetration. Now, that's not technically correct. And the reason why they did that was for gameplay purposes. But anyway, the way Hesh works is that it's a shell or it's a projectile consisting of lots of HE filler in it with a soft nose uh, cap on the front. And the idea is that this shell comes along and smacks into the armor of a tank and pancakes the, the plastic explosive inside the shell on the side of the tank's hull. A microsecond later, a fuse trips and detonates the high explosive. Now, this is all going on on the outside of the armor. And this is where it throws many people off, because, because at that point they think, well, how is it doing its damage? Well, here's the tricky part about it, and here's the interesting part about it. When this plastic explosive goes off, it sends a shock wave through the armor, and granted, this works best on steel armor. It doesn't work very well against composite armoring. In any case, it sends a shock wave through the steel, which causes vibrations to such magnitude that on the inside of the armor, it causes razor sharp pieces of the armor to break off and go flying around the inside of the tank, much like the rivets on riveted vehicles getting hit by an HE round, but except that this is far more devastating because you also get the overpressure effect on the inside of the tank. So what this means is that you can use Hesh against tanks, you can use it against light, uh, lightly armored vehicles, soft skin vehicles, you can use it against all the previous stuff that you could use HE for, but you can now use it against steel armored tanks. And that makes it far cheaper and far more effective than highly expensive armor-piercing rounds. Now, I mentioned earlier that Hesh has trouble dealing with composite armor layering. And the problem is that there are so many layers of different thicknesses and different compositions that the shockwave is usually dissipated by the time it gets to the other side of the armor. If it hasn't dissipated, a lot of tanks by that era have fitted what are called spall liners. And spall liners catch the pieces of metal coming off the armor, uh, kind of like a net, um, which are actually called spall. I should have mentioned that earlier, but in any case, these spall liners will catch the spall coming off the armor and protect the crew inside. So the problem with Hesh is that it is easily defeated with basic upgrades, which means that it's really only effective against early Cold War vehicles or World War II era vehicles that have just straight up steel armor. Now we get on to some of the most interesting stuff. Now, what happens if you have an AP round, an APC round, or an APC-BC round, or a Hesh round, and it's just not penetrating. It's just not doing the trick. It's just not killing him. You absolutely, positively need to penetrate the target, and you need to do it fast. This is where you load the skill. I mean, the APCR. The APCR, or HVAP round, as it is known in the United States, is a is generally a high velocity, super high velocity generally, tungsten cord or super hardened cord AP round. And the idea behind it is that you take a extremely hard metal like tungsten uh, during World War II or later on depleted uranium and you fire that shell at a ridiculously fast velocity or with a soft shell casing around it encasing the hardened steel core. What this allows you to do is to get insanely high penetration levels off of this round. The problems with it, however, are generally threefold. The very first is the weight of the shot. These are generally extremely light rounds because they need to go very, very fast. <laughs> 
Now, what this does is that it drastically reduces the amount of damage you're inflicting on the target. The other issue that you have is that these metals are ridiculously rare. Tungsten is not a common commodity, and it is best used in things like machinery for helping with production. Whereas a metal like steel is usually relatively in available, and so there are some tungsten rounds out there, but generally, most of the time you are issued steel cord projectiles. During World War II, tungsten rounds did exist, and they were used in fairly decent numbers, but they weren't used anywhere near to the same level as the standard AP rounds, and they were generally only used in emergencies. So, in case a Sherman ran across a Tiger, and if they happen to have maybe two or three APCR rounds for the entire unit, so they were extremely valuable rounds. And finally, the last issue with APCR is in War Thunder, especially, is its lack of normalization characteristics. Now, I wonder where this sounds familiar. Yeah, solid shot AP rounds. So, again, you are far more likely to ricochet off of sloped armor with APCR than you are with an APCBC round or what's coming up next, which I'll get into relatively soon. So, that's the biggest issue with APCR slash HVAP. It's a very expensive round. It is very light, so therefore it has very little damage inflicted on the target if it does penetrate. And on top of that, it is far more likely to bounce off a of sloped armor. Now next up, we get to one of my favorite rounds in War Thunder, and probably one of the best rounds in War Thunder, and that's Armor Piercing Discarding Sabo. Now, I explained during the T62 dev blog chats, and I've explained a little bit before in a few other videos, what APDS is, but for those of you who have not paid attention at all, or are recently just joining the channel, Armor Piercing Discarding Sabo. Sabo in French means shoe. And so, essentially what a Sabo round is, is a smaller projectile encased in a shoe around it that takes up the rest of the width of the gun barrel. Uh, or the rest of the diameter of the gun barrel. And so what this allows you to do is to, put, is to fit a smaller projectile that you can accelerate at higher velocities and therefore gain far more penetration than a full-sized APC-BC round. Now, the problems with this are, with APDS, are twofold. The first problem is that generally the projectile is at such a degree uh, smaller than the gun that HE filler generally becomes impractical at that point. The second issue was probably its biggest weakness, and that's that APDS in real life, you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from the inside at point-blank range. Um, the, the British were the very first to develop APDS, and they developed it for their 17-pounder anti-tank gun. And the idea was that, in theory, you could punch through the front of a panther at 1,000 meters. Now, granted, after 500 meters, you could not hit anything. Uh, the U.S. Army did some tests of their own where they fired, I think it was a grand total of about 26 APDS rounds at a plate. It was a standard target for the time, about, I think it was about 800 meters away. And after 26 consecutive shots and 26 consecutive misses, they gave up. Like, you just couldn't hit anything. Um, and the reason for this was that the shell was so small and so light, being accelerated at such high speed, that it would start to tumble and it would throw itself off course, or the wind would pick it up and it would start throwing it somewhere else. There was nothing to stabilize it in flight. Now, in War Thunder, the upside to APDS is that it is essentially APCR, 
but it's good against sloped armor. Now, God knows why they've decided to take this decision in game mechanics, but you know what? It is what it is. The APDS rounds are essentially APCR rounds with even higher penetration levels, but they're good against any armor you throw at it. Um, if it's flat armor, it'll go through it like butter. If it's sloped armor, no problem. The problems in War Thunder that start to occur with it is that it has low damage, and it generally its penetration starts to drop off after about a thousand meters. Now, I do want to clarify something. The Sabo that encases the projectile does not stay with it the whole way. Like the name says, discarding Sabo, the idea is once it leaves the gun barrel, the projectile's Sabo falls off of it, or falls away. And what this does is it allows the projectile to continue to fly towards the target, but at hypervelocity, and strikes the target with tremendous impact which gives it its high levels of penetration because it's hitting the target, even though it's a smaller round, it is hitting it with such kinetic energy because it's been propelled out of a much bigger gun barrel that it has much, much higher levels of penetration. Now, I mentioned earlier that there was nothing to stabilize the discarding Sabo round once it was in flight, and this was causing major accuracy issues. Well, this wasn't fixed until the 60s with the introduction of armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding Sabo. And the idea behind this was, as it says, it fin-stabilizes it. It adds a set of fins on the end of the Sabo shell, which keeps it stable in flight, much like an arrow. Now, I described this during the T-62 dev blog chat, so I'm just going to cut in that portion of the video so that you guys can watch that so I, because I've already described this. Now before I go any further, I'm going to talk about some of the ammunition types that they've announced for this vehicle. Apparently this is going to be an interesting vehicle because it's going to have the, a number of firsts with it. This is the very first vehicle in the game which is going to feature armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo. Up until this point, we've only had armor-piercing discarding Sabo. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'm going to put a picture up on screen for you. An armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding Sabo round effectively means that you are firing a large, super-hardened dart at an enemy vehicle. Um, all Sabo rounds are, are ways to get a much smaller projectile that's hardened into a much bigger gun barrel to take advantage of the much higher pressures and powder charges that are available for that gun barrel. So a good example of this would be the British 84mm 20 pounder gun. Uh, the armor piercing discarding sable projectile that actually leaves the gun barrel on that tank when you fire APDS is actually only 40 millimeters in diameter, which means that you're going to do far less damage to the target, but you can have a much higher level of penetration. Now, long rod penetrators, which is going to be what an armor-piercing fin standby's discarding Sabo round is going to be, long rod penetrators are going to do significantly more damage because what they have a tendency to do is break up inside the vehicle and cause far more shrapnel since there's a lot more projectile there to do more damage. So... It's entirely possible that this will have about the same amount of destructive power as, let's say, an APCBC round with an HE filler. So, now that you guys have gotten the, the rundown on all of the regular solid shot or HE filled armor piercing rounds, or the HESH rounds, or the high explosive rounds, let's talk about the last type of ammunition here before we wrap this up. And that's going to be shaped charges. Now, shape charges can go by a couple of names, and they do go by a couple of names in War Thunder. High Explosive Anti-Tank, High Explosive Anti-Tank Fin Stabilized, and finally, Hollow Charge. Now, this Hollow Charge or Heat Principle does not have to be constrained to simply shells. ATGMs, which are recently introduced into War Thunder, also follow the exact same principle. 
Now, a hollow charge, unlike an armor piercing round, doesn't work on kinetic energy, meaning that it doesn't matter how slow the shell is going or how fast it's going, as long as it detonates a optimum distance from the armor, it will have the exact same penetration as if you shot them at point blank range or as if you shot them at 2000 meters, which is one of its main advantages. The downside of high explosive anti-tank or shape charge warheads is that they can be easily defeated by spaced armor or hitting objects before actually making contact with the tank. Now there's a common misconception that heat rounds do their job of getting through the armor by melting the armor. This is not true. The way a heat shell works is that you've got a, uh, a hollow area in the nose of the shell that is surrounded by a copper cone facing inwards uh, towards the rear of the shell. And that copper cone is surrounded by high explosive. Now what happens is, when the shell hits an enemy tank, and de or detonates a proper distance from the target, the shell's HE detonates around the copper cone. And what this does is it melts the copper cone into a jet of plasma, which is then projected into the armor, with such force and such pressure on a single point that it literally parts the molecules of the steel armor and then passes through into the vehicle. Once it's inside the vehicle, it raises the interior temperatures to over several thousand degrees and essentially incinerates anybody inside. Now, like I said before, the key to defeating a heat round is to keep this event from occurring or to have it occur at such a distance from the vehicle that it doesn't have time to properly form or to get in close enough to properly form this plasma jet to penetrate the vehicle. This can be performed in a number of ways. The most basic way to do it is to add sl uh, spaced armor, not sloped armor, we've already discussed that, is to add spaced armor to the vehicle uh, in the form of cage armor or uh, plates at a certain standoff distance. Uh, it just depends on the technology at, available at the time. Now, later on in the 70s, explosive reactive armor is developed, and all these explosive reactive armor uh, blocks are is a steel plate uh, with high explosive sandwiched between another steel plate, and those steel plates are set at an angle. And the idea is that when a heat round hits this steel plate, the, this sets off the explosive between the steel plates and throws one of these plates into the path of the, uh, of the, of the plasma jet, which then throws it off course and basically renders the round inert, or renders the jet inert. It does not touch the vehicle. The downside to having these things is twofold. The first of all is that you can, the first problem with it is that you can only use it once. Once that jet, or once that piece is gone, or once that um, explosive reactive armor block is gone, it is no longer protecting that part of the vehicle. If you were to be hit there again and it made contact with the armor, there's a good chance it's going to penetrate depending on the type of shape charge it is. The second issue with it is that it is kind of a hazard for anybody around the vehicle that happens to be outside it. Now granted, if you are standing next to a vehicle that is being shot at, you are in a very bad place. <laughs> but if you are being shot at and the vehicle that you're standing next to has explosive reactive armor, well that explosive blast has got to go somewhere. So it's kind of an issue to be working with very, very closely with infantry if you have explosive reactive armor all over the vehicle, because you've essentially got little grenades all over the vehicle, um, just minus the shrapnel. So yeah, it's very disconcerting for troops who happen to be near one of these things when they go off. Now I get this question every now and then from people who ask, well, the tier 5 Leopard, for example, has a heat FS round that goes just over a thousand meters per second. Why don't they do that with the Panzer IVs, like the early Panzer IVs with the short barreled 75mm? Well, there's a pretty good reason for that. 
And that's because the development of fuses at the time was such that uh, heat rounds were not always reliable. They actually had a pretty bad tendency to detonate the fuse late. Uh, the, the, the fuse technology just wasn't fast enough to compensate for high velocity heat rounds. The only way you could get a reliable heat round or a reliable shape charged round for a for these for these shells at the time was to have it at a much slower velocity. Now this made aiming harder for the gunner because he had to elevate the gun more, but it also meant that they could observe the fall of shot easier. Now later on, after the war was over, uh Fuse technology developed drastically, and what this allowed to happen was you could now have high-velocity, high-explosive anti-tank or shape charge warheads fitted to shells, and you could propel these things at much, much higher velocities, and they would still detonate the target, and they would still detonate after hitting the target, and they would detonate at a pretty optimal distance, and this was only achieved by going to electric fuses whereas before they were all sort of manual fuses. Now, the other interesting thing about these old fuses is that you see in War Thunder, they've got all these vehicles with all this extra, like, track armor on them and everything, and it's pretty magical. It'll absorb full-sized armor-piercing rounds without much trouble. Here's a hilarious fact. Um, the Germans did some testing and figured out that the sh that the tracks actually enhanced the penetration of high explosive anti tank projectiles because it was giving the projectiles proper standoff to be able to detonate and properly form the penetrating jet. However, when they told the troops in the field, the troops said, Fuck off. <laughs> this makes us feel better. We're going to keep it. So, this is why you see. It, like Sherman's, for example, with sandbags all over the front. Um, again, this was sort of counterintuitive, but if it makes the crews feel better, they're more likely to get into combat, and they're more likely to fight better. So, who are we to tell them that they're wrong? Now, holy shit, I just looked at the time, and it is 1.53 a.m., and I just looked at the timeline here, and it is just about 37, or nearly 38 minutes uh, this is definitely going to be a very long one, so I'm probably going to cut it off here. I, I feel that the that I've given a proper explanation of all of the ammunition types available to you in War Thunder. If you guys have any further questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I read every one of them. I will eventually get to them if they're good questions. Uh, if they are stupid questions, I may still get to them. In any case... This has been Many Miles Away. Thank you for listening to me for the last 40 minutes, and I am signing off, and I am going to bed.